Today is the 24th of May, 2023. Five days ago on the 19th, Martin Amos died. All right. He was, I don't know if you'd say an important figure in my literary life, but a memorable one for lots of reasons. He sort of defined a time or the tail end of a time when I think literature still played an important role in popular culture. It had still a huge following. I'm going to introduce this with, well, I'm ultimately going to talk about his memoir, Experience, which came out in 2000. But let me just speak about the time in literature that he represented for me. So I'm 55 years old. I think Martin Amos died when he was 73. When I was growing up in Staten Island, or when I came of age on Staten Island, after I'd come back to, from college, I had a really good friend named Louis Dimmick who wrote this fantastic small book of prose poetry called This Music, which is about him growing up on Staten Island and being part of the punk music scene and you know, he was in a band that played at CBGB's down on the Lower East Side. And he grew up in this sort of one parent family on Staten Island, a poor white kid. And he wrote beautifully about it. And that's really who I grew up writing with. We both taught at the College of Staten Island and we became friends and we bonded over books. We would get high, we would drink, we would eat, we would talk books. And sometimes we would go into Manhattan from Staten Island. We would take the Staten Island Ferry across. And if you walked up from, um, from the southern tip of Manhattan, you would come across a whole bunch of bookstores in that time. So this was before I had a cell phone, before I looked up anything on the internet, before 2000. We'd walk up, there was a, one of the early boarders was in the bottom floor of the World Trade Center. We'd check that out. Then we'd go up town, we'd go check out Spring Street Books in Soho. Then we would cross Houston Street and we would check out, I think there was Shakespeare and Company. There was um, a place called, I think, um, St. Mark's Books. There was also a Barnes and Noble up in that area around NYU in the village. And the great thing about bookstores then is that it was a place to browse. There was a lot of books that I would, that I and Lou would discover there. And we'd compare, read opening paragraphs and buy almost off the cuff. We'd see something, love it and take it home. Sometimes we have a general idea what we were looking for, but other times we wouldn't. And that to me is the glory of a bookstore. What they stock, really. And the surprises that are in that stock. There seems to be these days to be a lot of people who don't like Amazon, who think it's uh, almost anti-literary, anti-book to buy books from Amazon that we should buy from the mom and pop bookshop, for instance. I don't know if I 100% agree with that. I mean, everyone's out to make a buck, the small bookstores, as well as Amazon. And one is on a very large scale and one is on a very small scale, but it's the same plan. And if a bookstore doesn't have a reason to bring me in there with good stock and with owners and assistants who read the books and can direct me to what I love. Somebody like me who doesn't have sort of the typical literary interests, then 
what am I going to do in the bookstore? Why go to that bookstore? To look at all the bestsellers stacked on the center table? I'm just not going to do that. I'd rather browse on Amazon, especially if I know what I'm looking for. If I, for example, receive a recommendation from a podcast or on one of the social networks or from an interview that I see on YouTube, I go directly to Amazon. I buy the book that I want. It's there the next day. Why add on a certain inconvenience to go to a mom and pop bookshop that probably won't have that book? Because normally these books are a bit esoteric. They're not texts that have been published recently. They go back a few years. Anyway, on one of these trips at the St. Mark's Bookshop, I had already read London Fields. I'm not sure when that book came out. In the 90s, late 90s, early 90s. I'll put it on the screen when I publish this video. And I was struck by the book because it's very immersive. It really puts you into the scene. I don't remember facts from that book so much, but I remember a feeling. The book lured me in and put me in a place that I can still remember, okay? Even though I can't remember specific things about it. So I was impressed by him, by his talent. He's a guy that can really write about anything and make it good, anything, okay? And very often those types of writers, well, they have other challenges, right? When it comes to writing that one great book, the book that will guarantee them life beyond death, right? Those struggles are more like trying to pare down because they have this talent to write about anything very, very well. But they have to write about it more than just very well. But I was struck by his talent, how it jumped off the page with London Fields. And I was at St. Mark's Bookshop High and I picked up this book of essays. He's written a bunch. I want to say it was the war against cliche, but the dates just don't work out. It was before that because the war against cliche came out after experience, I think in 2001. But it was about cliche, the essay I picked up and read in the bookstore. And it totally called me out as a writer because at the time I was immersed in what I thought was this groundbreaking story about somebody who plays with homosexuality. Although he's a heterosexual, he plays with a homosexual affair. I thought it was brave. I thought it was authentic. I thought it was real. I thought it was cutting edge. And I read this essay and there was this throwaway line in it that said something about how cliched this idea was. And it was a point in my young writer's life when I realized how much I had to learn. And that's the thing. I would say, even now when I read Experience, I read it a few years ago and over the last couple days I was looking through it again and I was just struck by how erudite he is. He has this knowledge of literature. He can talk about the greatest poetic lines in the history of literature. He comes from a group of British novelists like, um, is it Clive James? I don't know if that's his name. Again, I'll put it up on the screen if I've got it wrong, but there's a great interview that Clive James did with Martin Amos. A series of interviews Cl Clive James, I hope I got his name right, did. And one of them was with, Ma with Martin Amos. I'll put it, the link down below. But also there was Ian McEwen, uh, there was Julian Barnes. This is the thing about Martin Amos. He grew up with this father who won the Booker Prize, who is a borderline genius who wrote Lucky Jim in a whole bunch of other books, a, liber a, a literary celebrity in England, a superstar in the literary world of England, had read everything, had all these ideas on what great literature was. Among the best writers writing in English at the time, he grew up with Kingsley Amos as his father and Kingsley Amos's friends, like Philip Larkin, the great poet, okay, or Robert Graves, the great poet. So he was steeped in sort of literary lore. He grew up with it. He hung out at Robert Graves' house in Mallorca. So his father, Kingsley Amos, I would say one of the great reasons to read experience 
is to read about the character that his father was. This conservative, hilarious, curmudgeonly, anti-Semitic, mm, in many ways pathetic, gregarious, neurotic, brilliant writer, growing up with him, loving this man, being loved by this man. He was also a womanizer. The character of King's Lemus comes across so unbelievably well in this book. So unbelievably well. And then also, you know, there's Martin Amos's friendship with Saul Bellow, with Christopher Hitchens. There's this great scene where Christopher Hitchens, Martin Amos, and Saul Bellow are together talking about the Jewish question about Israel. And the way Martin Amos describes it at the time he was married to a Jewish woman, Christopher Hitchens had realized that he was partially Jewish. And the idea of, you know, the rights of Israel and how, how certain members of this unbelievable triumvirate, right, thought or spoke with their hearts about this issue. And Christopher Hitchens, no, only thought with his mind. Just fascinating stuff. All the stuff that he writes about his teeth, about growing up famous, about always being in the public eye. All of that is fascinating. You know, Martin Amos had it all, really. You know, he was born in this privileged literary environment. All the connections he could possibly want. All the talent he could possibly want. The drive to do it. The love of literature. The love of reading. And he really didn't, he came through, he made the most of his talent, I think. He did the absolute best with it. You know, reading a memoir like Experience, you know, there's the added aspect of everything in his life is kind of interesting. There's this literary gossip. So you read it also for the people he knew, for the experiences he had, but it's also peppered with a lot of scenes that would work in any memoir by any unknown writer. So you're reading it as much for the public figure that he was, for all that he'd accomplished and all, the pe all that the people around him had accomplished and the group of friends that he was among. You're reading it for that, but you're also reading it for just the writing ability. It's an autobiographical dump is really what it is. And I don't mean the word dump in any sort of pejorative sense. He just had so much material. Letters that he'd written, he'd received, parallels with his own dad, his sense of humor too, his fights with Christopher Hitchens, his, his fights with Julian Barnes, all this kind of conflict that exists, all these mistakes that he made. The book just comes alive. I miss him. I miss this type of writer who really, who tried to write the big book, who tried to really define or change society with what he wrote about. Just the ambition of a guy like that and how he respected ambition in others and Updike, in Bello, in Mailer, all these people he, in, another friend of his is Salman Rushdie. That ambition, the thought that their books might change the course of civilization was still real when he was writing. Maybe it had been even truer in the generation before him, but he was still writing with that idea. He was still writing with the idea of changing things. I'm going to finish this with a quote from the book. There's a Saul Bellow's great friendship with a guy named Alan Bloom, which, who wrote a book called The Closing of the American Mind. I remember my dad reading that, and I read it too, and it's really about, he was a conservative too in many ways, 
who believed in the liberal arts and there's always a period when you know books on the liberal arts and how the liberal arts are dying there there's always a book about that or an article about that in the new yorker that's always something that seems to be dying and the books in a way kind of prove that they're not and the articles prove that they're not because there's always a kind of great interest in them but there's a line that Martin Amos quotes in the book. That's another thing about this book experience. It's filled with quotes by great writers. Filled with them. By the greatest writers. Nabokov. James Joyce. Again, poems by his dad. By John Milton. Okay, he writes, It is the hardest task of all to face the lack of cosmic support for what we care about. Sometimes I feel like every day there's less cosmic support for books, for high literature. Every day there's less. And it's hard for me to see that dying in a way as I die. I wonder if it will exist in the way that it made me excited to go with Lou to check out all those bookstores, to see what the great writers were writing about, and that I could bring that home and expand my mind with it, you know? It is the hardest task of all to face the lack of cosmic support for what we care about. I care about books, man. That's what I care about. The books of others and the books that I hope to write. Anyway, thanks for listening.